steps away. All right, hello everyone. How are we hello. doing? Good. <laughs> all right, so um, thank you guys so much for coming tonight. We are so excited to see all of you here and uh, welcome again to the Heritage Center. My name is Emily Prochesky and uh, in case you have not been out here yet, our hours are Tuesday through Sunday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. We're only closed on Mondays for the rest of the week. You can come and see us. Um, I want to give a little bit of an intro here to our <coughs> guest. <laughs> Um, before he comes up, uh, so here we go. Uh, Greg Cash is an executive in the medical device industry. He is of French and French Canadian descent, as you can see from his, his regalia here. In addition to being on the French American Heritage Foundation of Minnesota Board of Directors, <coughs> Greg is also a member of the Concordia Language Villages National Advisory Council and is a staff member at their uh, Lac de Bois, am I saying that right? <laughs> and uh, laboratories uh, programs. He holds a BA in International Marketing and Business Administration from the College of St. Thomas and speaks French, Italian, and German, but not all at once. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, great gosh. Bonsoir, merci d'être venu. Good evening, thank you for coming. Uh, I can also speak English if you speak slowly and clearly. <laughs> So I got interested in fur trading when I found out that from my mother, who grew up in Minnesota, I grew up in Northern Illinois, I found out that one of our ancestors was one of the first two documented non-Native Americans in Minnesota. His name was Madar Shuar, Sierra de Gauzier. Might be more familiar with his much younger brother-in-law who begged him to bring him on the trip. His name was Pierre Despre Radisson. So the Swedes decided to call it the Radisson Hotels instead of the uh, Big Jose Hotel. It's, it's a little easier to say. So what I'd like to do is, uh, is you know, give you a little brief history of fur trading in Minnesota. Audrey's uh, having trouble hearing. So. I really need it louder. <laughs> okay. No I'm problem. Sorry. Do you want to use the mic? No. I think I'll be all right. I'll just right. I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> the volume. Okay. Is that better, Roger? Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, the fur trading industry played a major role in the development of the United States and Canada for over 300 years. Native Americans brought beaver, fisher, otter, mink, bear, deer, fox. Muskrat, badger, raccoon, rabbit, and skunk furs to trade. But the most prized was the beaver cub. <clears throat> we'll explain that in a little bit more detail. The beaver helped help value the other uh, furs. By the way, if you have questions, please feel free. We can make this as interactive as you want. Or uh, we can and talk about questions at the end. So Europeans traded uh, goods like metal cookware, wool blankets, cotton cloth, tools, jewelry, later weapons and gunpowder for the furs. Trade goods such as alcohol and tobacco, which was later used to cause problems for Native Americans. You may be familiar with the famous Hudson Bay Company blankets. So those were used uh, in the original fur trade. My, uh, well, I'll get it for the later. Like it just wanted you to start again. <laughs> yes. Here we there go. We go. <laughs> so why beaver? Fur trade began because of men's fashions in Europe. Men were wearing top hats made of beaver fur. Why beaver fur? Well, beaver is one of the few animals that doesn't shed or hibernate in the winter and they had very, very repellent uh, pelts. So um, these were perfect for hats in, uh, in Europe and in England and Ireland where it rained a lot and they were expensive. So a hat like this would cost the average worker half a year's wages. So this was for the bourgeoisie and the, and the rich. So let's talk about a few definitions. Bourgeois, actually gentlemen, 
were the fur trading company partners, initially French, but later British, who negotiated contracts with Voyager. My ancestor was not a Voyager. He was a coureur de bois, or a runner of the woods. These are independent and generally unlicensed uh, entrepreneurial French and French Canadians who traveled in New France and the interior of North America, including uh, Minnesota, New France, as we now know it as Quebec. And uh, usually to trade with First Nations peoples by exchanging various European items for the birds. Voyageur or travelers were contracted employees, mainly French Canadian as opposed to French, so born in the New World, who worked as canoe paddlers, bundle carriers, and general laborers for fur trading firms. They were also called engagé, and an engagé in French means someone who's employed. Uh, they're employees. So this gives you an idea of what a bourgeois looked like versus a voyager. So I mean, I don't know if it was literally meant to show the, the hierarchy, but the voyager's on his knees and the, you know, the bourgeois is striking a pose, looking, looking eminently rich. So my ancestor, as I mentioned, was uh, an, an independent fur trader along with uh, Redstone and uh, came to Minnesota around 1660, sometime in the spring and summer. It's actually a uh, book that was written in the 1800s called The uh, History of the Minnesota Valley, and it talks about them coming. In mid-August in 1660, they returned to Montreal with 300 Native Americans and 60 canoes with a wealth of skin. The governor of New France, uh, who was appointed by the king promptly confiscated most of the furs, charged them without, would try trading without a license, find them, and briefly jail my ancestor. So he was not happy. So de Gauzier uh, returned to France to seek redress and also to try and uh, negotiate with Colbert, who is the finance minister, no relation to Stephen Colbert that I know of, <laughs> uh, the finance minister of Louis. The 14th. Colbert showed no interest in either giving redress or getting into the fur business. They were busy trying to finance uh, Louis the 14th's wars across Europe. So on his return, Ian Radisson heard that there might be some investors in Boston, so they went there. And then finally to England on the suggestion of some of Boston's people to obtain financing. And there was a cousin of the king who uh, was interested in taking this entrepreneurial venture. So eventually after one failed voyage, uh, Charles Ford was constructed on the Hudson Bay. And in 1670, the Hudson's Bay Company was formed to conduct the fur trade. So it was really de Glossier and um, Radisson that, uh, that were the initiative behind the Hudson's Bay Company. This is a rendering of what people think uh, my ancestor would look like with the mustache. There was never any, uh, at least, uh, enduring uh, picture or painting of him. Uh, and they did know what Radisson looked like. And this is, uh, you know, him as a as a younger man. So the fur trade really consisted of three major eras. In 1500. And you know, in the 1500s, fur trading was going on in the you know, East Coast around Hudson's Bay, Sault Ste. Marie, New York, that area. And then, you know, after 1760, they found a route to Minnesota, which was much, and Wisconsin, which were much richer with furs, beaver pelts, etc. And so that lasted for 260 years, and it ended when the British conquered New France. So the Battle of Quebec. Generals Wolf and Montcalm was the definitive battle for the control of what's now Canada and was fought on the land of one of my other ancestors, Pumpem or Abraham Martin. That battle was fought on the plains of Abraham, which was land that was given by the governor general to my ancestor for services that he provided. 
So the British era lasted until shortly after the War of 1812. And then from 1816 to about 1850, uh, the Americans took over. And I'll talk about that uh, later. And the beaver population declined and cheaper hat material were found. So that was kind of 1850-ish was kind of the end of the boom of the fur trade. So who were the uh, actors in the fur business? Hudson's Bay Company set up a series of trading posts along the shores of Hudson Bay, where indigenous people would bring furs to trade. They also had, uh, you know, their headquarters in Montreal. And so their business model was you come to us and we'll give you trade goods for your furs. The Northwest Company um, was formed by Scots in 1779. They took a different approach. They brought the trading posts to the indigenous peoples. So they sent out <clears throat> brigades of canoes manned by Voyager from Montreal to an inland base on Lake Superior. Uh, initially, Grand Portage or Grand Portage, and then later Fort William, which is now uh, Thunder Bay. Thunder Bay, before it was rebranded, was Fort William and Port Arthur. In the, it was the 80s or maybe the early 90s. They, rebranded themselves as Thunder Bay. The American Fur Company was founded in 1808 by John Jacob Astor, who was an industrialist and uh, entrepreneur. And he capitalized on the anti-British sentiments and his commercial strategies to become a major competitive to the British commercial dominance in the North American fur trade. So the border was kind of closed at that point. So we'll get into the history, but uh, they could kind of work unfettered south of uh, the Canadian border. So, Voyager. Voyager were mainly French Canadian, recruited from villages and towns like Quebec, Montreal, and Trois Rivières, or Three Rivers. They could be identified by their distinctive clothing, often wearing a red toque, and a sash. It's called a ceinture fleche. Ceinture fleche means uh, a belt with arrows in it, if you can see these are kind of an arrow pattern here. And they think this originally came from the native peoples, but the Voyager adopted it. And uh, then they would wear a wide cotton shirt. That was their protection from the sun and mosquitoes. You can imagine that. <laughs> Fighting the mosquitoes with a white cotton shirt. <laughs> and they also wore breeches with leggings and moccasins. So Voyager were short because they didn't want them to take up much room in the canoe. They wanted room for trade goods and fur. Um, and they were strong and healthy men who could withstand harsh, we harsh weather conditions and maintain a very fast paddling pace. So it was expected for each Voyager to work at least 14 hours a day. Wow. To be able to paddle 50 strokes a minute and to carry two pièces or two bundles of furs that weighed about 90 pounds each uh, for each. So these were, these were strong men. There were many risks. Um, men drowned. Uh, most of the Voyager did not swim. Suffered broken limbs, twisted spines, hernias, and rheumatism later in life. Uh, mine comes from sports, not uh, forging 90 pound uh, bundles of furs. And there was a hierarchy among the, uh, the Voyager. Montreal men, or Monsieur de Lar, the pork eaters. So these were the men that would canoe from Montreal to Grand Portage, would trade goods and return with bundles and pelts. Northmen, or hivernants, which means winterers, would take trade goods from Grand Portage to points further west uh, of Lake Superior via rivers and lakes. Oh, I have a question. Yes. <laughs> From Grand Portage, they went to Lake Superior? You no, know, so they came down Lake Superior, across Lake Superior. Okay. They would come to Grand Portage. And go on north. And it's called Big Portage. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, as I have. Uh, it's a nine and a half mile portage. Yeah. And the reason they had the portage is there are two waterfalls right. on the Pigeon River and several uh, uh, rabbits. So which way did they go, east or west from there? They went to what's now Winnipeg. 
on the Pigeon River, what's now Winnipeg. Okay. They went on the Pigeon River. Okay. And over the course of the time that the uh, Northwest Company was there, there was something like 1 million bundles of beaver pelts. That, oh. So they would carry, they, they, they would arrive in these Lake Superior canoes that were 37 feet long. They would put it at the base where there was a base camp and a rendezvous house where they did uh, some of the uh, trading. And the, the owners of the Northwest Company would come down at the end of the season and do some negotiations. And then they would carry trade goods up to uh, the river and they had a fort there called Fort Charlotte, which is no longer there, but that's where the campsites are. Yeah. And then there were smaller canoes that they could take down the Pigeon River. They'd go west, they'd come back with bundles you know, beaver belts, and then down we go. It's not an easy portage. I couldn't imagine doing it carrying 180 pounds on my back. Terrible mosquitoes. Yeah, and black flies. I don't know if they had black flies back then, but they're the worst. They had those white shirts, though. So. Yeah, yeah. No problem. <laughs> so uh, the Ever and were experienced voyager who would spend their winters at a fort in the interior, and they're in Minnesota, there are many trade stores. We'll talk about some of them, but um, you know, there's one in uh, Pine City. Uh, it's you know, still, it's, I think it's been rebuilt, but you know, they were all made out of wood, so they didn't survive uh, five, maybe four or five centuries. But uh, um, there are a few places around that have got them. The Ever and were a tough breed and considered themselves above the Montreal men, who were seasonal voyager. Uh, Ever now. Um, you know, at the summer rendezvous, would camp at a different camp than the Montreal men or the Voyager. And so, you know, there was a class system. And there's also a pecking order in the canoe. So the avant, which means front in French, was the bowman. And that's kind of the motor of the canoe. Very experienced in uh, canoeing. And then the person in the back of the canoe was called the gouvernail, or the steerman, who uh, sat or stood and steered by the order of the bowman. And then there was the express, or the express who could endure a high rate of paddling for several hours. And then for every four to six canoes, there was a conductor or a pilot who was kind of the boss, judge, jury, I don't know about executioner, but. <laughs> And so, you know, that, that was the pecking order. So they need lots of calories because they're doing a lot of work. So, and they also needed food that wouldn't spoil as they travel. They had two large meals a day, breakfast and dinner. They began paddling before sunrise and they would stop just before 8 a.m. to have breakfast uh, after already three hours of paddling. And they'd have a meal of pork, beans, and biscuits that were pre-cooked the night before. And then they'd have a midday snack of pemmican and biscuits around 2 p.m. while paddling. And then at night, they'd settle by the campfire to enjoy a, a, a meal of pemmican, split peas, or cornmeal, often in the form of rubabu, which is a hearty stew. So when I work at the Voyager camp, I generally cook and we have rubabu every day. <laughs> You know, new variations. We've decided not to use the bear grease, which uh, they normally would cook the pemmican in. Uh, and uh, we don't use pemmican. And of course, you know, these days you've got vegans and gluten free. And so we have to be really careful with our uh, Aruba Boo. So, what were some of the key dates and milestones in the, in the fur trade? Around 1670, the Dakota Sioux attacked and drove the Huron and the Ottawa out of the Western Great Lakes. After this time, many Frenchmen moved into the region and began trading directly with the Native Americans. In 1679, uh, Daniel Gressalon, Sieur de Lutte, conduct, conducted peace talks between the Anishinaabe and Dakota at Fond du Lac, which means bottom of the lake, which they named after him. Kind of messed up the spelling a little bit, but you get the general idea. And then he later goes to Milax and join and, and claims all those lands for France. So um, over the course of the fur trade, France claimed a lot of land uh, on either side of the Mississippi and 
probably remember from history class, we got that back from Louisiana Purchase, which a lot of Minnesota can come from the state. That uh, over a third of Minnesota is Louisiana Purchase. I have a question. Yes. Um, did he rename Milak? No. It was already named that? Yeah, I think it was. Well, he gave it a French name. <laughs> okay. But they took it from the Anishinaabe name, which was Thousand Lakes. Mm -hmm. So here's an interesting piece of trivia. Any lake that has the name Lake First in Minnesota was named by the French. Lake Superior was Lac Superior because it was the highest and the largest of the Great Lakes. Um, if it has Lake afterwards, it was probably named by English. Now that doesn't hold true 100%, but close. So I have a good friend who uh, has a, a lake home on, in Wisconsin on Lac Coudre. Which uh, means short ears. Short ears because my, my ancestor also explored that area. I don't know that it was him, but they, the Frenchman noticed that the uh, local tribe had short ear lobes. So they called them the short ear tribe and then they named the lake after, after them. That was so. so sassy. So he returned to uh, uh, Lake Superior, traveled up the northwest shore, building a post. I guess there's a problem with this one, but come, come. Kamenista Quia River, which is now Thunder Bay, or near Thunder Bay. You may have remember the name LaSalle. 1682 LaSalle traveled through the Great Lakes and down the Mississippi to its delta. So it went all the way down. And all those lands were on either side of the river were, were claimed from, for France. War broke out in 1689 between France and England, and it interrupted the trade as far west as Minnesota. And this is uh, kind of shows you here's Grand Portage. So they would come across from Sault Ste. Marie. This is Sault Ste. Marie down here. They would come across to Grand Portage um, and then they would go take the Grand Portage Trail up to the Pigeon River. Actually, this is, I think, there was a pitch that was like they didn't go that far, so it's kind of more like about here. And they could take that all the way to, to Rainy Lake. By the way, in French, it's called Lac La Prie, which is Rainy Lake French. <laughs> so, how about that one? So, here's a few more key dates and milestones. 1696, by royal edict, France closed all its western fur posts. Trade was officially abandoned for over 20 years. However, Corps de Bois, or illegal traders, kept up their operations. In 1754, the French and Indian War began. Trade was interrupted. Most of the licensed traders in the Voyager were called to fight against the British. 1760, Battle of Quebec, and New France was conquered by the British. All trading rights and privileges became British. Furs were now sent to London instead of Paris. 1767, trade regulations were returned to the colonies. Exclusive licenses were abolished. And the start of unregulated trade increased. The use of liquor and gunpowder, the fur trade and tobacco. British traders were allowed to establish wintering posts amongst the Native Americans. And construction began on permanent structures at the Grand Portage by the Northwest Company. And these are what these outposts look like. This is not Grand Portage. I can't remember where this is, but so you've got a fence around it. Um, this is a Northwest Company fur trading post because that's their, uh, this could be Pine River actually. Uh, you see their flag. And they had, you know, buildings are there with make canoes and store canoes. These are smaller canoes than the, the you know, the Great Lakes canoes. So they were, about the size of what you would consider a normal, normal canoe in these days, 14, 12 or 14 feet. And uh, they would, you know, conduct trading. You see these guys carrying, you can't say very well, but they're carrying bundles of furs. Um, so they've obviously come back from a, you know, a trade trip with the Native Americans. <clears throat> Seventeen ninety one, Alexander Henry. 
sent a group of traders into the northern war zone between the Ojibwe and the Dakota. The first year they traded at Leech Lake and the following year at Red River. They went north and then back to uh, Grand Portage. 1800, the Northwest Company operated 117 trading places. And that's a substantial operation. 1808, uh, John Jacob Asker started the American Fur Company. Minnesota employees included Hippolyte Dupuis, Henry Sibley, and Jean Baptiste Ferryville. So, um, if you're familiar with the Sibley Historic Site in Dakota County, in Mendota, which is really where St. Paul got started, and that's what cities got started, related to the fur trade. There are Henry Sibley's home is there, Jean Baptiste Faribault's home is there, and then people Dupuis uh, operated after his fur trading time, operated a general store. So those buildings are all open for uh, tours. We're not doing anything this weekend. <laughs> um, there is the annual celebration of La Fête de la Saint-Jean-Baptiste, or the Feast of St. John the Baptist. This is the Quebec national holiday. And it used to be a big holiday in France, uh, less celebrated now. They celebrated it by bonfires, and etc. So at the Sibley House this uh, Friday night, there will be uh, traditional music and dance. There will be a bonfire. The houses will be open. And interested to come on down. Uh, um, 1804, John Sayer and his Northwest Company Voyager built the Snake River Fur Post near Pine City, which could have been that previous one actually. I forgot to check the reference on that. Uh, 1850, the War of 1812 ended. The United States took back the lands that had been occupied by the British. And at this point, the United States forbade any foreign traders to operate in American territory. Northwest Company withdrew. So they withdrew north of the border. Now, there were plenty of French and French Canadian around here. Um, they could continue to work, but they found a new partner in the American Fur Company. And as a matter of fact, for probably the first 200 years that there were Europeans here, the sole language other than Native American spoken was French. It wasn't until the mid 1800s that the uh, English would come in and English started to take over as the language that was mainly spoken. So, American Fur Company hired ex Northwest Company traders to work for them. Why not? Uh, but, you know, it wasn't uh, without difficulty. A border war began between the Northwest and the American Fur Companies. 1821, Northwest Company and Hudson's Bay Company, fierce competitors were forced to merge by the British. And there are also business factors. There is a you know, high transportation cost shifted through the Great Lakes. But the border war still continued between the Hudson's Bay Company and the American Fur Company. And it really didn't end until 1833 when the American Fur Company abandoned its, its posts along the border in exchange for an annual cash payment from the Hudson's Bay Company. So I'm a business guy one of the early examples of royalty payments. <laughs> um, there was a uh, series on, I think it was on Netflix, called, called it might have been Pioneer, but had Jason Momoa in it. And I don't know, there's a lot of Hollywood to it, but there were really fierce battles and wars between these fur trade companies. They all had militias and soldiers. They were all fighting. And uh, it was, you know, there were like no rules, basically. <laughs> so in 1842, the American Fur Company failed financially. They were replaced by Pierre Chouteau and Company of St. Louis. And in 1850, beaver hat was now out of fashion in Europe, replaced by a cheaper silk version, signaling the end of the heyday of the fur trade. Beavers uh, became uh, you know, not exactly a, 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 a worthy commodity of sale. This is a very famous Francis uh, Hopkins painting of a voyager on, the, uh, on one of the Great Lakes trying to shoot some rapids. Um, 
So this is this is kind of what the Voyager looked like. So this is kind of the end of the, the formal portion of the presentation. Uh, would love to. How many guys are on there? There's a lot. <laughs> I've been on Voyager canoes, um, the 37 foot ones, and we had 15 people in one with room for more. So <laughs> they're big. They're wide, very wide, and you know, 37 feet long. So. Is that a they were stable? They, they were stable. Lakes, That's they, lakes, they, they had to be right. <clears throat> so you know, Lake Superior, you got high seas. I mean, I've been in you know, five foot seas in a sailboat. You couldn't imagine you could be mm. on Lake Superior, yes, ma'am. So I'm gathering that the Native Americans were the ones that did all the trapping. Yes, and for the most part. So the, the voyagers did not. They just picked, they just went and picked it up and traded. Yep. They would work a deal and, you know, steel pots and pans worked a lot better than clay clay pots for the natives and blankets. You know, they didn't have uh, wool products. They're using buffalo pelts and furs. And yeah, so. And, and a lot of the traders would take on native wives. Yeah, so that brings up an interesting story. So um, in New France, this was becoming a practice, and the, um, the priests and missionaries who were over there became really concerned. So they appealed to Louis the Fourteenth, and Louis the Fourteenth. So the, the main people that were over were, you know, uh, indentured servants and you know a few early entrepreneurial Frenchmen, um, military to try and maintain control and fur traders, and. Uh, so the uh, clergy was upset they were taking native wives and so appealed to Louis XIV and Louis XIV um, created a program called Les Filles du Roi, Daughters of the King. And he, uh, his administration, if you will, went out and recruited young single women and they were given a small dowry if they would travel to New France to find a husband. And uh, there's a very short series that was done on National Geographic that they can continue with, only had three episodes, but it's also a book by uh, an author by the name of Anne Proulx, P-R-O-U-L-X, uh, called Barkskins. It talks about that era. Um, the, uh, I enjoyed the three episodes they had, but it kind of ended, and I'm reading the book now. But uh, these indentured servants were called Barkskins. They were they had to work for two or three years and then whoever took them on would give them a plot of land and they're out working the land and they had rough, tough, uh, you know, calluses and skin. So they were called bark skins. <laughs> many of them married the Fi du Bois, um, and, uh, and many of the military who decided to stay would marry the, uh, the Fi du Bois. I would, I would have assumed that, that the part of the reason you, to marry a native woman was to curry favor with the tribe or something? Yeah, I think the trade goods did most of the, the, the favor currying, to be honest. <laughs> um, you know, it, it came in handy later. Um, you know, so Fort Snelling was, was really built to uh, control the, the fur trade and control the Native Americans in, in Minnesota territory. And, you know, at, at a certain point when they were being displaced, um, you know, if you could demonstrate native blood, you would get land. So they would give you a plot of land. So, you know, these people that intermarried with native women um, would have a, a land claim. So there's an island uh, in the Mississippi or the Minnesota right off of Fort Snelling that was um, basically owned by uh, Jean-Baptiste Ferbo's wife, who was native. And uh, uh, what was her land? basically um so that was you know that was a reason and then there was all kinds of finagling going on for people to try and get this um certificate to be able to to to, to get land. a lot of shenanigans going on um and the city of Faribault is named after Jean-Baptiste Faribault's son so he left the Twin Cities and Jean-Baptiste eventually went down and joined him and that's where he died so he left his house in, in Mendota uh, but um, it's, uh, it's a story of how fair about it. Other questions, comments?
Could you tell us more about your regalia? I know you'd mentioned the sure. bells. Yeah. So um, this is a toque. Where's your toque? Toque means knitted cap. In Quebec to this day, if you're wearing a stocking cap in the winter, it's called a toque. Um, this is the uh, ceinture fleche, which is the, uh, the flesh, flesh means arrow. So it's the arrow pattern belt. And this wasn't just a belt. They would use it to help carry things or you know use it to get leverage to pull things and so it wasn't just decorative it was functional and as you get older we can grab you around right? <laughs> <laughs> just never went around twice but there it doesn't anymore where did you obtain that uh at the voyager okay this i bought for like two dollars online oh it was some some historic site and then this clothing so these are the breeches I mean, I'm not going to flash you, but if, if you look at these breeches, I cheat a little bit. I wear uh, suspenders to keep them up. But you know, these are button, uh, you know, breeches. There's no, um, there's no fasteners or zippers there. You know, I guess I'm originally, oh, these, these are wood buttons. So wood buttons. Um, and then I forgot to mention this. This is called a sac à feu. And at like Voyager, we use them for name tags. So it's got my French name on here, Um, uh, But every Voyager had a sac à feu because um, they kept in here dry tinder, uh, a flint, uh, and a piece of metal. So that at any time, if they had to, they could start a fire. And, you know, and it, and it stayed dry if they didn't fall overboard. And the uh, one of the things I learned uh, working for Le Voyager at Concordia Language Villages is Birch bark will burn even when wet. <laughs> so if you have dry tinder and, and you know a flint and a metal, you can, you can start a fire with just about anything. Uh, and then moccasins, they generally wear moccasins uh, as well. Um, so yeah, I uh, know I've got a fancier shirt than the white shirt I used to wear. But... Does the length of it have any significance or yeah, that was just the yeah, style? Yeah, the only size would fit me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. You mentioned that 1850 was the end of the demand that you were at. Correct. Uh, was it that that caused the fire? Where did you have gas? Or was it just, just at that same time? Just well, the you know, yeah. So, um, so the American Fur Company went out of business. They were financially uh, insolvent. Um, <coughs> Northwest Company ended up merging with Hudson's Bay Company. And Hudson's Bay Company to this day. Uh, exists uh, in Canada. It's uh, um, you know they still sell the blankets, but it's like a department store. Mm -hmm. So um, they kind of went from the fur trade and, and pivoted their business model, if you will. And you know they're uh, the French call it the Bay, or the French call it the French speakers call it La Bay, and the English speakers call it the Bay. So yeah. Hudson's Bay Company has been around all this time. And I went into I was skiing up in uh, Banff a few years ago and. Walked into the Hudson's Bay Company there, and there happened to be a young lady from Quebec, and she politely uh, listened to my story about my ancestry, but would not offer me the family discount. <laughs> <laughs> and that same problem with caches of cork in Ireland. So, what do you do? We have a question from uh, Angie S. on Zoom, and she would like to know whether there are any good resources for researching whether one's French Canadian ancestors were voyagers. So can you find out if your yeah. family were there? So um, there is a uh, Minnesota Canadian genealogy group mm -hmm. in the Twin Cities. That would be a good place to start. Okay. Um, uh, we have a woman who's actually Quebecois from Quebec on our board that also works with them. Her name is Carolyn Mayer. Mayer means the best, so she's the best. <laughs> Carolyn Mayer. And uh, so, you know, she could potentially help um, depending on where Angie S is from. I know an Angie S, I wonder if it's that Angie S, but um, <laughs> the uh, uh, French American Heritage Foundation has a, an event coming up on October 16th in Dayton. Uh, Minnesota. Um, it's kind of about the genealogy of that area, but you know. So the our, our organization was founded to um, increase awareness of the French history and culture in Minnesota. So we put on 
three or four programs a year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this presentation I did originally was a French Heritage Foundation presentation a few years ago. Uh, no need to update the slides. <laughs> um, the uh, and, and so we do a variety of different things. We had a presentation on a number of years, a couple of I don't know, I've lost track of time with COVID, but uh, on Prairie de Chien. So mm -hmm. Prairie de Chien, Wisconsin, or Paris de, de Chien, Prairie of the Dog. And people, Jean, Jean Baptiste Ferbo spent time in Prairie de Chien before he came back up to, to Minnesota. Like I, the, the Voyageur, they traveled and I found out where I got my wanderlust when I realized <laughs> I had a Voyageur ancestor. But uh, um, yeah, so I mean, you know, we, we do some genealogy based presentations, but most of it is, is on the history and culture. So check with the Minnesota Genealogy Society or, or check with your local historical society. Mm -hmm. You know, Little Canada happened to be founded by people from Quebec, so they've got kind of a wealth of riches at the, mm -hmm. the Little Canada Historical Society, but, um, you know, that's a, another place to look. Or, you know, you can always do the DNA route and right. Ancestry.com <laughs> and go from there. So. On Tuesday afternoons at the History Center, there are professional genealogists that will help people. That's great. Uh, Every Tuesday afternoon. So it's the History Center in St. Paul. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. There you go, Angie. Yeah, Angie says, perfect, thanks. Um, and she said, by the way, he and I share Abraham Martin as an ancestor. So, How about that? Go. Well, and I, she's my cousin. There, there you go. <laughs> um, pretty much everyone uh, who's the French ancestry from uh, Quebec is descended from a Fidu Wall. Um, makes sense. So, yeah. There, and, and, you know, I, I this is way more detail than anybody needs, but there are a couple of diseases that you can trace back to one Fidua, where the genes been passed down from generation to generation. It's all her fault. Yeah, <laughs> what do you do? Um, yeah so, so my, my story, as long as you brought up my uh, genealogy. So, Medarchor de Gauzier went back to New France, right? Mm -hmm. And he died in uh, Trois Rivières, Three Rivers. Um, so, that branch of the family stayed up in Canada. And then, um, so he, his first wife, and that's how I'm related to him. By the way, they all died. He didn't, no such thing as divorce in those days. Of course. So he was married to um, Pierre Despree Radisson's half sister, who also died. So he had a third wife. But his first wife was uh, one of the daughters, I believe, of uh, Abraham Martin. And um, so then, it's either we'll, well, I've got the genealogy somewhere, I haven't looked at it. It was either the next generation or the generation after that, um, the husband of one of uh, Abraham Martin's uh, 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 progeny or next generation uh, was married to a soldier who came to um, Indiana uh, to Vincennes uh, to be a mercenary in the American Revolutionary War. So he was the commandant of Fort Vincennes. And so if Angie has that lineage, she, they have lots of good information on ancestry in Vincennes, Indiana. Obviously, it's got a, got a French name. Yeah. I have yet to make it there. I got close to Lafayette, but I had things to do. I had to go back, but I, I plan to go down there. But that, there's a line of the Martin family that ended up in, in Vincennes, Indiana. Interesting. Yes? Yes, white men, we have had problem of treating these fairly over the years. Yes, we have. Yeah. Um, were, were they considered a good trading partner back in the time calls from these people or anything like that? Um, the French treated them pretty fairly. Um, so they had good relationships. As a matter of fact, there were, um, you know, I talked about the war between the, uh, the Huron, the Iroquois, and the Ojibwe, or Dakota, sorry. Um, the French actually brokered peace between the tribes. And there were like 50 different tribes that came to Montreal. And that kind of set the stage for good relations with the Native Americans. So there was trust. And so the, I think they treated them fairly. I mean, you know, um, supply and demand, right? So, I mean, beaver pelts weren't particularly interesting for these people. Um, whereas, you know, trade goods were. Uh, the beaver pelts were probably worth a heck of a lot more than the trade goods, but it's supply and demand. So, you know, you tell me. Um, and then English and Americans really didn't treat the Native Americans very well at all. The French 
seemed to have good good relations uh, for the most part. I'm sure there were bad actors, in, you know, like there are in everything. Yeah. Yeah. Don't know if I remember the name Foyabat or something like that. It's uh, Fa Fort Fal Davoin. Okay. Yeah, so Fal Davoin in French means uh, uh, wild rice. Well, well, wild, wild rice. rice. Wild rice. So I haven't, but it's on my list. Yeah, I've been there. It's really. I dated a woman from Manoma, though, which is <laughs> which is a Ojibwe <laughs> word for wild rice. <laughs> so her, her uh, she was not Native American. Her dad was the veterinarian in town. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I'd like to go to Full Dublin. It, it, it's very interesting. That's what I hear. Yeah. Yeah, it's like between Webster and uh, right. Hayward, Wisconsin. And and I, you know, I'm up there all the time visiting my friend, and you know, I used to have a friend who had a, a lake place in Webster, so I have no excuse for not having done this. <laughs> it's, it's on my list for sure. Yes. Do you think that the, the natives that they um, traded with was it mostly Anishinaabe or Dakota? In Minnesota, it was yeah, but they traded with all tribes. You know, the French. Yeah, really anybody, any trading partner that wanted to trade with them, I think. What were the traps that were used to trap the beaver? I, I don't know the answer to that. You don't know yet. Yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, they're probably, you know, they didn't have metal, right? So they must they have, didn't have metal. Must have been some kind of a snare or, you know, but I, I don't know for sure. I'll ask at this history museum. Please do and let me know if you okay. will. Um, I know we had beavers on the farm growing up, and blowing up the dam certainly didn't do a thing to get rid of them. <laughs> yeah. just, uh, so we trapped them and relocated them. Oh, or I don't know what I don't know what might have to do with them. Like, should, <laughs> should, should, shouldn't really uh, take them to the them. city, show yeah. them around. Yeah. Well, great. Any any other questions? So I'm going to put a plug in again for the French American Heritage Foundation. Please go to our website. So it's the French American Heritage Foundation, Minnesota. Um, I believe the uh, website is F-A-H-F-M-I-N-N dot org. And in addition to the programs that we do, um, we have publications. So we've published a number of books, a couple on the foundings of the, the Twin Cities. So there's one that's called They Spoke French, teach about the history of French speaking. There's another one called, uh, I think it was first there was a, a chapel. You know, it's how St. Paul got started. Mark is coming to speak here he in is. August. Yes. Uh, on, I think on the Snake River. Uh, that's another one. He's doing one on the chapel first. Right. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And then um, there's a one called Where Waters Meet. So the um, Minnesota River during the fur trading era was called La Riviere de Saint-Pierre, St. Peter's River. And um, there's actually a reenactment group called Les Hivernaux de la Riviere Saint Pierre. Uh, and the Americans came and renamed it the Minnesota River, which was the original native name. But, you know, it's really where the Mississippi and the Minnesota River met that Mendota started with, you know, Hippolyte Dupuis, uh, Jean Baptiste Ferbeau, and Henry Sibley. And they kind of had their establishment there, and then it kind of grew, and, you know, Pig's Eye Piranha came over and uh, founded St. Paul, and the first priest there said, we're not calling our town Pig's Eye, and named it St. Paul. <laughs> so. Thank you. Yes, Dave. How popular is the French teaching language in Minnesota? Uh, I think we might have a French teacher back there. No, no? Uh, but uh, I did a project at, um, on immersion schools in yeah. the county. Yeah. There's I remember now, there's plenty of French immersion schools in Hennepin County. There's at least five, I think, at last count. There's, there's Lake, Lake 12 Dinar and Ramsey. In Ramsey, yeah, there's Lake 12 Dinar. I went to Norma Vale in uh, Edina. Oh, yeah. Yep. So. Very nice. Yeah. That's how I know a little bit of it. Okay. Um, so, this is a little known fact, but Minnesota has more immersion schools than any other state in the Union except for Utah. We don't have Mormon missionaries, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. So more Spanish, and right. There's at least five different languages. And there are at least two hundred different languages that are spoken in the home in Minnesota, which is another amazing one. So 
Wow. Yeah. But I mean, you know, the, the popular French overall has declined as a language, uh, I would say, over the years. You know, Spanish has increased. Um, you know, we, we've seen that at the Concordia language villages that, you know, we finally consolidated down to, to one Lac du Bois. We used to have one in Da Vinci, one in Hackensack. And so now, you know, Voyageur is kind of more of an outward bound. So that for those of you with children, <laughs> the, at the, you know, they, they both speak French or teach French through immersion. Both of the French camps, all 14 of the different camps use the immersion method and um, 14 different languages. But um, at the Voyager camp, we teach them about the fur trade. Uh, we teach them uh, more of the Quebec style of speaking French or the New France way. So instead of, uh, you know, if you ask someone, comment allez-vous or comment ça va, you know, the French would say très bien, merci. Well, the uh, uh, Quebec would say c'est pas pire, non? It could be worse. <laughs> <laughs> and no is their version of A. <laughs> so it's kind of a Canadianism. So, and, and you know, they have some really ancient words. Um, you know, when they came over in the 17th century, there were no cars. So the word for a car in, in French speaking Canada is a char, which comes from chariot or wagon. Right. So that's some, and you know, when you say thank you to someone, you know, and in Parisian French, you answer de rien, or il n'y a pas de quoi, or you know, something like that. In Quebec, they say bienvenue, which literally means welcome. Well, and I guess that's probably what they said in old France. I, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's a tough it's tough for languages right now, and you know, we're doing every, everything we can to try and keep yeah, languages great. being learned because through language comes understanding and understanding of different cultures. So with that, yeah. if there are no more questions, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for coming.